Hello and welcome back to the Toolbox Project. In this video, we are going to get started on sizing the lid as well as cutting the tongues on the edges. Let's get going. So the lid to this box is going to be solid wood and I've got a bit of oak here that's actually book matched. We've got a lovely light stripe going down the center that the camera might pick up. However, because this is solid wood, we are going to need to account for some sort of movement with this. So. Let me explain. So this bit of wood throughout the year is going to expand in its width. It is not going to expand in its length along the grain, or it does, but it's so negligible, it's not even worth worrying about. But primarily it's going to expand in its width. It will also change slightly in thickness, but because that's such a short measurement as a percentage, again, it's not really worth worrying about. It is just this width that we're going to be concerned with. And there's various calculators online that you can type in the dimensions of the piece, the species of the piece, as well as the maximum and minimum humidity that this piece is likely to face throughout the year. And it will give you a definitive answer of how much that wood is likely to expand and contract throughout the year. And after doing that a few times with timbers like this, just, you know, standard native ones, I've got a general idea of how much it's likely to expand. And so in this project, I'm going to leave about four millimeters. So at the moment, this piece is already pre-thickness. It's planed up on both sides, completely parallel and everything like that. We just need to cut the overall size out of it first. By the way, I've taken this down to 13 millimeters. I've chosen that thickness just purely by picking it up and working out if that feels a nice weight for the lid, if it were to be hinged or something like that. But you can obviously make it thinner, thicker, whatever. Anyway, how do we get that overall size. So let's start with the simplest one first, which is the length. This is the one that is the fixed measurement and we don't need to account for any expansion and contraction. It just is what it is. So to get that measurement, we are going to first get the long side of the toolbox and measure the distance between the shoulder lines, not the overall component, just the shoulder line or the bottom of the sockets. In this case, it is 390 millimeters. Now that's all very well, but we need to account for a groove on the end of the component as well, which means we need to add six millimeters onto that side and six onto that side, making our overall measurement 402 millimeters. So just take note of that somewhere. I'm just gonna write it on the wood itself. I can't lose it that way. Then, as for the width, we're going to do exactly the same thing, but on the short sides this time. So distance between the shoulder lines, in this case is looking to be 215. And then we obviously need to add six mil there, six millimeters onto this side to account for the tongue at either side, which makes it 227 millimeters wide. However, that is not accounting for any expansion and contraction. That is if we wanted this to be a snug fit with no wiggle room. So with that 227 mil, we need to take off four or whatever you happen to calculate the shrinkage to be so what did i say 227 take away four two two three and so next all we need to do is size the material according to those dimensions we've obviously been through this before so we'll gloss over this but instead of just going for it and sizing it as it is i'm going to slightly reorient things so that i get that nice white stripe directly through the center of the piece so i'm going to go 223 divided by 2 equals 111.5 put the ruler on 111.5 mark at zero mark at 223 do the same on this side and then join those marks together. Mark the waist and then slice those off on the bandsaw, getting about, you know, a millimetre away from the line or something. And we're carefully plane one of those edges straight and square. And then measure up and put a knife mark at 223 and do that on both ends connect those marks and then plane back to that new line. So with the width sorted, we've just got to do the length now. And looking at this board, I'm much more of a fan of this side of it with the narrower straighter grain rather than this wider stuff on this side. So I'm going to try and preserve as much as I can here. We're going to start with putting a square from the face edge of the timber. Very important. And scribe a line up a couple of millimetres from the edge. From that measurement, we'll do another mark at 402 millimetres, which is our overall size. And from the face edge again, scribe that across the piece. And don't worry if this 402 millimetres ends up being slightly too long to fit in the box, as we'll probably discover later, you can always shoot it down later on. So we're going to take that side down to the line using the shooting board. This side, slice off the bandsaw and then do the same thing. A 
Okay, so with the panel sized accurately, the next thing we're gonna start doing is laying out the tongues on the outside. So firstly, identify the top of the box on one of the components, doesn't really matter, and set a marking gauge to the top of the groove. Once you've done that, work out what you want to be the top of the lid. In this case, it's this one. And using that setting, we're gonna push the stock against that face and scribe around all four edges of this lid. Once you've done that, do the same thing, but for the bottom of the groove. And again, scribe that from the same face round all four edges. And if you line that up with the existing groove, what you can see is that's gonna give you a lid that is flush with the top of the box. So with the markings around the edges established, next we need to work out how far in these needs to go. So for these long edges where we're gonna be dealing with that expansion and contraction, this needs to be the same at whatever depth the groove is currently at. In this case, six millimeters in. We set this to the depth of the groove and scribe that up the long edges. And if you then line that up with the short sides and get it central, what you'll then find is that these lines that you've just scratched up are actually slightly shorter than the internal shoulder lines. Thus, when this whole thing's assembled, there's gonna be a small shadow gap up both sides of the panel. This is what we want because it's no point accounting for that expansion and contraction in the overall size of the timber if you're not going to account for it on the shoulders. It's just gonna end up pushing the box apart anyway. So we need to have that shadow gap there. And if you follow the processes accurately so far, that's what it's gonna give you anyway. As for the tongues on the ends, however, if we scribe this to the same six millimeter setting, because this has been cut without any expansion and contraction in mind, it's not going to give us any shadow gap at the end. So it's up to you if you want to increase that shoulder line to eight millimeters, therefore giving you a two millimeter gap all the way around, or if you just want to keep it at six. I'm giving you this option because now, when we fit this, let's assume we go for eight millimeters at either side, thus giving us a two millimeter gap all the way around. This time of year, it's gonna look good, it's gonna look nice and even, but when it expands or contracts or whatever, it's gonna then get thrown off. If, however, you choose to have no gap up either end and just that shadow gap along the long edges, it's not gonna look right this time of year, but then who knows, it might expand to fill up those gaps later in the year. This is one of those difficult things. For me, I just make it look nice now, and then hopefully further down the line, I'll just sort of forget that the expansion's even a thing. And don't worry, we will be doing more things later in the project to disguise this expansion and contraction, such as adding chamfers and things like that. So don't get too caught up in it. But for me, I'm gonna go for six millimeters here, and then eight millimeters either end, therefore giving me an even shadow gap this time of year. <laughs> So resetting the gauge to eight, scribe that up, both ends on both sides. So I've currently got a rebate cutter set up in the router table at the moment, but to be honest, any straight cutter like this, as long as the diameter is roughly twice that of the width of the rebate, you'll be absolutely fine. But anyway, this process is going to involve raising and lowering the cutter to suit the different offset we've got for the top and bottom of the lid, as well as changing the offset of the fence to account for the six and the eight millimeter groove. This isn't really good practice in theory because you want to be working constantly off a fixed point, most likely being this fence. However, we can't do that in this case because we've got various widths to account for. You could space it out with a shim in theory. For example, you could set this to eight millimeters, run it all the way through, then put a two millimeter shim in there, run it through without moving the fence, and that's then gonna give you a six millimeter depth of cut. But that would be assuming that you're able to get a two millimeter shim using a drum sander or something like that, which I'm assuming you have not. So instead, we're going to do this process the less accurate way, but just take care throughout. So the first process we're going to do here is the ends of the lid. The reason for this is, as we push it through, if we get any breakout on this backside, it doesn't matter because it's going to be removed when we do the long sides anyway. And I'm gonna start by doing the underside of the lid. So I've already gone and got the rebate cutter set up to the height of that lower marking gauge line. We're then gonna use the same technique we did in the last lesson to get the fence offset to eight millimeters. So using the edge of the board to set the fence to zero, lock it down, double check, tape at either end to mark the zero point, and then unlock the fence and set it to eight millimeters back beyond that point. And there's our first setup. Finally, I'm going to set up a featherboard from above so that I can keep my hands nice and clear from the cutter. And obviously just double check that featherboard isn't going to interfere with the cutter. So we're gonna run that bottom one through on both ends and I'm actually gonna do the top one as well. The rebate is much deeper on the top and so doing that all in one pass might result in a poor quality finish. And so while I've got the cutter set up at this shallow cut, I might as well take off half of it now. Here's some of that breakout I was talking about, but 
doesn't matter because that's being removed. Anyway, with that same fence offset, now all I've got to do is bring the cutter up to match the linelets on the top of the lid. Reset the old feather boards. Okay, and with that same height setting, we're now gonna reset the fence to six millimeters to do the top side of the lid on the long edges. So we can use our tape for that. Okay, and then keeping that same fence setting, we've just got to drop the cutter down to match that original rebate that we cut, which is the underside of the lid. I would encourage you to set it slightly low to begin with and then bring it up to the required height. That way you can sneak up on the fit. Then once it comes off the router table, what you can do is put that into one of the shorter sides and that will give you an indicator of how big that shadow gap is gonna be. In this case, it's there about two millimeters, which is exactly what we wanted. Now, whether you leave it like that with square edges is up to you. For me, I like to take it a step further and put a little chamfer around all four edges on the top and the bottom as well which just gives a nice little detail and will also help disguise any discrepancy with that gap should it change over the year. And I simply do that with a shoulder plane. Just make sure to count the number of strokes you do on each corner to ensure it stays consistent. Right, there we go. That is how you make the panel for the lid. So obviously in this episode, we've been focusing primarily around the router table or solely around the router table. If you want any more information on this rebating process using hand tools, however, there's a ton of supporting resources in the description below that will talk you through that process each step of the way. So as always, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please do not forget to press the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next lesson.